When Jesus comes, the truth about all things comes. Truth about God is in Jesus. Can't know God without Jesus. Truth about ourselves. We can't know ourselves without Jesus. His teaching, His person. Truth about the way of salvation comes. Can't know how to be saved without Jesus. The truth about what is good and beautiful, what is evil and ugly. All the criteria that make something right or wrong, beautiful or ugly, is in Jesus. What difference does it make that the light of God has broken into the world in Jesus? That's the question John Piper answers from John 3, 16 to 21 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on May 17, 2009. Let's start with verse 19. This is the judgment. What? The light has come in to the world. Now, let's just stop right there and get that clear. The light has come into the world. What is that? That's Jesus. John, the writer of this gospel, wrote in his first letter, God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. And he said in the very first verse of this gospel, the word was God. And then in verse 14, the word became flesh. What else could he be but the light of the world? And he says so in chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. What does that mean? Oh, we should meditate long over that. I am the light of the world. Let me give you a few pointers that I think it means from meditating on these contexts. It means that Jesus is the sum of all truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He means all truth is summed up in Jesus Paul said, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you want to know anything fully or truly, you must know it in relation to Jesus. Which is why secular education is such a problem. Our students have to be supplying the key all the time that unlocks what the teacher's saying. The, the, the teacher can say a hundred amazingly true things, and they're all wrong. They're all wrong. Algebra's wrong. Chemistry's wrong. History's wrong. P.E. is wrong. And of course, we can learn from all that wrong stuff. But you can't know what it's about. You can't know the point. You can't know where it came from, where it's going, what's it got to do with my soul, what's it got to do with why and how I live my life, which are the big issues in life. When he comes, when Jesus comes, the truth about all things comes. Truth about God is in Jesus. We can't know God without Jesus. Truth about ourselves. We can't know ourselves without Jesus. His teaching, his person. Truth about the way of salvation comes. We can't know how to be saved without Jesus. The truth about what is good and beautiful, what is evil and ugly all the criteria that makes something right or wrong, beautiful or ugly, is in Jesus. How can the world know such things? He made them all. He decides what's good, what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's beautiful, what's ugly. It's all decided by Jesus. He made it. Makers decide. We don't. Right thinking, right feeling, right doing, all defined by and measured by Jesus. This is some of what it means. I am the light of the world. We Christians should never, ever, ever be ashamed of our Jesus. You, you, there is nothing greater than Christ. Shame at commending Christ simply means you're ignorant. Or... Temporarily chicken-hearted, <laughs> blind, irrational, crazy, lost your mind. He's truth. He's everything. He's what the world needs. He's what the university needs. 
You don't need to be ashamed of this, Jesus. All wisdom, truth, is summed up in him. So, verse 19 says, there is a kind of judgment. How so? How so? How is it that when light, this light comes into the world, judgment happens? How is that? And the rest of the text explains. This is, let's read it again. This is the judgment that light has come into the world and, and here's what happens, here's the, here's the split. People loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. Stop. Now that's the negative response. Verse 21 is going to be the positive. So stay with the negative a minute. Let's know ourselves and who we are fallen under the wrath of God, under condemnation. If you're an unbeliever, that's where you still are. If you're a believer, you're still contaminated by it and need to constantly own your true identity in Christ and put to death the old identity. So let's know ourselves here, believer or unbeliever. Let's know ourselves. You can sum up what what I just read about this person in five steps. Number one, we'll go from the, the bottom to the top. Number one, their works, our works, works, what we think, we feel, we do, all that stuff is evil. Verse 20 at the beginning of the verse I mean, it says so at the end of verse 19, their works were evil. And verse 20 at the beginning, they do wicked things. Number two, they don't want this to be exposed. What we're thinking, what we're feeling, what we're doing, my whole life of evil, I don't want that to be exposed. So, verse 20 at the end, lest his works should be exposed. He doesn't want that to happen. So first there's evil, and then there's the fear and the desire that it not be exposed. Number three, therefore, they love darkness. It's safe. Verse 20, in the middle of the verse, look at it. And people loved the darkness rather than the light. This is a love affair. Unbelief is at root a love affair. Love is is a big word. I mean, he did not have to speak this way. He could have stuck with belief language. We all kind of think, ah, oh, believing in Jesus is a decision. Well, sort of. I mean, underneath decisions are torrents of reality. And this is this is a description of them. There's love going on down there for all the wrong things. Darkness. I love you, darkness. I love you, darkness. You are so safe. You love me so much. You protect me. Number four. And therefore, they hated the light. Verse 20 at the beginning. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light. You got to. You got to. All that stuff is just going to look so horrible and shameful. And I can't stop. In that thought, I just got to keep loving the dark and pushing the light away. And so number five, they don't come to Jesus. They don't come to the light. Middle of verse 20, and does not come to the light. So there they are, five steps. One, I'm doing evil stuff inside, outside, I'm evil. Number two, I don't want that to be exposed. Number three, therefore I love darkness. Number four, therefore I hate the light. Number five, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. I'm not believing. Believing and coming. In John, same thing. So, this is Jesus' explanation of unbelief. Remember that. The division into two kinds of people, verses 19 to 21. Same division as verses 16 to 18. Some believe, some don't believe. And now, he's going into the inner workings of our our soul. So, let's just linger here for a minute. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. What I mean by that is my life is never fully in sync with the infinite worth and beauty of God. Never. Never fully in sync with the beauty and the worth of God. God is always worthy of more than I give Him. 
He's always worthy of more intensity than I feel for Him. Always worthy of more consistency of obedience than I give Him. Always worthy of more consistent mental work for Him than I give Him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. Who does that? Raise your hand if you do that. All of it. All of it all the time. Nobody. Because you don't. And I don't either. We're sinners. And therefore we're under wrath because God is so infinitely worthy of more than we give Him. And we dishonor Him every day of our lives, believer and unbeliever. We do this. And the difference is not that one is good and the other is bad. Simply. The Holy Spirit's at work on believers. They are changing. But I've been a Christian for since I was six. I'm 63. I'm not optimistic about finishing without sin. <laughs> I hope my sights are not too low. I just love grace more a lot. Jesus says now that we dishonor the Lord every day. And the reason that people hate the light, and love the darkness, is this. When, by some amazing work of providence, we begin to know ourselves sinful, it becomes either really angry-making or really fear-making that that might be exposed. Just imagine your whole life and all you did last week and all the weeks before just out there, just out there. This is why people don't come to Christ, this text says. Lest their deeds should be exposed. Shame that is deserved is a horrible thing. You ever been embarrassed to the point of just wanting to run out of the universe as a little kid? Wet in your pants at school. I mean, that's nothing. What if everything were laid bare? This is why people don't come. It's just terrifying that I might actually have to live in absolute light. Nothing hidden. They don't come. They stay hidden. Now, careful. That does not mean people don't commit public sins. (laughs) You might draw the conclusion from what I just said. Oh, people are afraid that their sin will be exposed, so they never do it in public. (laughs) What? Why? Why? If it's so terrifying to come into the light with your sin, why are sins so publicly flaunted in our day? There's a real simple reason. As long as the public banishes the light, there are enough people to admire the sinful behavior that you don't feel shame but approval. As, as long as the light of Christ is kept out of the sphere in which you're acting out your evil, public sin is in the dark. Public doesn't mean light. Public means dark people observing dark behavior and liking it because it confirms their own. But if God shows up, we call this revival, moving on a people in a church or in a community, and suddenly Christ and all of His standards, the holiness of God and all of its perfection begins to rest with some weight upon the world. You know what happens? People are either driven to Christ because of the horror of their own shame or they're driven away further into darkness. 
and the ways divide, and that's the judgment that this verse is talking about. Let's close by looking at the positive response. This is where I believe most of you are, and I hope the rest of you will be. Verse 21, but, this is the alternative from hating the light, loving the dark, and not coming. This is the alternative. Verse 21, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now, I think this sentence does not express a single act, but a principle of ongoing action. Let me paraphrase it so that you can see it. This is partly rooted in tenses that I can't show you, and partly contextually, partly theologically. I'm, this is a judgment call. You've got to weigh it. I think what was just described here is a principle of ongoing action, not just one thing that happens in your life. So let me paraphrase it. You can hear hear what I mean. It would go like this. Whoever goes on doing what is true, that is acting in accord with the light, will always come to the light and not run away from it. And the reason he will come is so that it will be clear that this ongoing behavior, this doing of what is true, has been the work of God in himself. That's the way I think we should read it. In other words, the ultimate contrast here between verse 21 person and verse 19 and 20 person, the ultimate contrast is not that one hates the light and the other loves it. That's true and hugely important. It's just not the ultimate contrast. The ultimate contrast, secondly, is not that one believes and comes to Jesus and the other doesn't believe and doesn't come to Jesus. That's true. It's just not the ultimate contrast that Jesus is drawing out. This verse takes a surprising turn at the end, doesn't it? You kind of, whoa, where did that come from? And that surprising turn at the end of verse 21 is to point to the real ultimate difference, the real ultimate contrast between the person of 19 and 20 who's loving the dark and hating the light and refusing to come to Jesus and the person of verse 21 who's coming to the light and loving the light and discovering how horrible and hugely ugly the darkness is. He's coming. What, what's the real, final, decisive, most important, ultimate contrast between these two? The ultimate contrast is that the believer, the one who comes, who loves the light in verse 21 is coming because God is enabling him to come and God is working in him all these things that are making him feel in sync with Jesus and not threatened by Jesus. Let's read it again. Look at it carefully. Whoever does what is true, so you're thinking... Your feeling, your acting are conforming to the value of Jesus, the true value of Jesus. Whoever does what is true comes to the light. So that, and here's the, here's the ultimate contrast, he's got a, a design in coming. that I've devoted the last 30 years of my life to trying to help people understand. So that it may be clearly 
seen. That's what he wants. Oh, I want something to be seen. He's not just coming so that he gets saved. He's not just coming so that his sins will be forgiven, so that he won't go to hell and go to heaven. Yes, amen. We love that. Oh, what would we do without that? That's not what this verse says. This verse says he's passionate about something being seen in his life. What? So that it may be clearly seen that his works, his thoughts, his feelings, his deeds, his his whole newness has been carried out in God. Meaning in the power of God, in the enabling of God, in the moving of God. Here's the difference between the lover of the darkness and the lover of the light. In the darkness, I'm king. I do exactly what I want in the dark. Pride is the number one killer. I live in the dark where I call the shots and nobody in the dark can criticize me. Because you can't even see what I'm thinking and feeling. But the person who's had that pride just snapped right in half and said, your only hope is grace, buddy. And I'm here. I'm for you if you'll have me. If you'll just quit that stuff and break like a child and, and receive me like a little baby, I'll be there for you forever. Yes, you'll be a welfare case forever. And I will be your all-providing shepherd, lover, king, friend forever. You'll be lowly, I'll be up. Is that okay? Is that a deal? And these people say, I want that to be seen more than I want anything. I want, I want the world to see that I am saved by grace. I want the world to see that I have been changed by God, not me. This is Jesus saying, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and give glory to whom? Tell me. Your Father in heaven, God. That's what this person is. That's newness. That's radical. That is God-centered, Christ-exalting, and rooted right here in verse 21. The main point of this text is there is a kind of judgment that came into the world with Jesus Christ. This judgment reveals that the guilt of not coming to Jesus is in our hearts and the gift of coming to Jesus comes from God's heart. Or, to put it another way, unbelief is our fault and belief is God's gift. Or, one last way, this ties in with the point that I've just made. If a person so loves the dark, so hates the light, that he will not come to Jesus, the light, he will perish and thus magnify the justice of God in his damnation. And if a person has, by grace, fallen in love with the light, been willing to let all the absolute horrors of his life, his mental life, his heart life, his sex life, his physical life, his money life, his killing life, be exposed and forgiven and cleansed and justified and thus willing to come to the Savior, he will go into life magnifying the grace of God, which is what that it might be clearly seen that this was wrought in God. So my invitation to you, Christian and non-Christian, is come to Christ. Take the risk. It's not an ultimate risk. It feels like a risk. You mean with all the stuff that for the last 20 30, 40, 50 years. My mountain of sin is higher than you can imagine, John Piper. That's true. But it's not higher than God can imagine. And it's not higher than the cross of Christ. So just let it go. 
Take the shame. He will wipe that away. You will not live in shame. So God, I pray now for those worshiping and praying right now. I pray for life. I pray that we would fall out of love with the darkness and fall into love with light. I pray that we would be willing to let all of our lives be exposed as the sinners that we are and that we would know that the grace of verse 21 is offered freely to all. Oh, grant that we would come. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Light and Truth. God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our series, Behold the Glory of Jesus, with a sermon titled, The Joy of John the Baptist. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.